Welcome back, our traders and investors. This is Kyle Bazzi filling in for Joel L. Conan for the last day. Joel will be back on Monday with my partner in crime here, Dennis Dick, and our first guest of the morning, Mr. Sean Udall, the tech stock strategist. Uh, Sean, I see here that you uh, you got hooked in the early 90s making some money on NVLS systems, and it looks like uh, ever since you've been, you've been riding the tech wave through the boom and everything. How are you doing this morning? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I was going to say that that's what hooked me into, into tech. I probably, I probably didn't start doing sort of deep work into it. Um, really until probably, uh, probably after, after the whole first big meltdown post 1999. Um, so on that, that, you know, when I started seeing stocks selling for literally less than net cash, um, that, that got me going on it and, and pretty much ever since I've been doing some, some, some pretty deep dives on, uh, a, a number of tech names. Now it also says here, and it uh, definitely should be of note that you were working at Morgan Stanley and, uh, Solomon Smith Barney managing over 350 million in client assets. So, I mean, you obviously know a thing or two, um, uh, about the tech sector and, and what's going on. Um, right- Absolutely. Uh, great. Now uh, let's talk about some uh, some big tech stocks that we're looking at right now. Um, you know, looking at Twitter and Facebook here since their earnings releases. Uh, what are you seeing with those? You know, moving forward, and, and will they fill the gap? Yeah. Well, you know, I've I've, I've actually been sort of a contrarian bull on Twitter, especially at, at very very low levels. Um, so I mean, that's uh, you know, we've talked about this name a number of times on the show on prior appearances. I I really like the stock, and I just think that. You've got, I think, actually, I think the technical setup's really, really good. Um, but I think the, the better setup's the fundamental setup. I, I think, I think Twitter's going to be a hundred billion dollar market cap company. And by the way, I, I said, I said Facebook was going to be a hundred fifty to two hundred billion market cap company, pretty much on the day of their IPO. The difference was, I actually liked Twitter on the day of their IPO, and I, I didn't like Facebook on the day of their IPO. Facebook had to kind of go down and get and get cheaper. Um, before I really liked it. I actually think, so if you want to talk technicals on Facebook, I was, I was bearish Facebook after they reported. I, I actually did, did some short trades on it, made a little bit of money. It wasn't great. At this point, I actually think Facebook's going to break and, and going to go uh, somewhere between 80 and 85, Pro- probably a bit around 85-ish. I, I might want to lean short, although there is that huge probability that once stocks go you know, above 80, 85, they tend to go to $100. So, I'm going to have to be a little careful on the short side on Facebook in that range, but so so I've kind of flipped from 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 short term bear to short term bull on Facebook. But I, I I prefer Twitter much much more, both fundamentally and technically at this point than than Facebook. Why is that? Just because Twitter's got such a lower market cap? Well, that's part of it. I think I think the biggest reason I have a thematic view on Twitter, which is completely different. I think I think Twitter can can serve and become a greater utility to more people. Um, it's also the real time data, data mining aspects. I mean, Facebook, they do real time data mining on it, but it's just not, uh, Twitter covers way more subjects. Um, and I think Twitter is going to, I think ultimately Twitter is going to be more, a more powerful platform, um, than Facebook. I don't know if it'll get, it'll, it'll eventually become bigger than Facebook, but I mean, again, I think they're going to be a hundred market, hundred billion market cap. That's, that's almost a four bagger. Maybe it is a four bagger from here. Um, Facebook, I mean, Facebook's had the move. I mean, I liked Facebook when Facebook was dirt cheap. Everybody hated Facebook. I, in oh, fact, yeah. I wrote a piece on the whole mobile monetization issue before anybody even really was on that story. So it, it's, it's hard for me to really love Facebook at 74 because I loved it at, at 25. Yeah. So it's, it, I, I think, it's I, ran think along the, I hate this, it has, I hate this expression that the easy money's been made because Facebook could get a lot bigger. But I really, in, in this case right now, I mean, I think if you're playing Facebook, you got to play it for five to ten play moves, and I think if you're playing Twitter, you can play it for fifty to one hundred percent moves. Right, and Facebook has kind of figured a way to incorporate the advertisements here. Twitter really hasn't yet. I think they're still just experimenting with the advertisements because you know I'm on Twitter quite a bit and I see those Twitter ads, but there's not really like in my face as much as the Facebook ones. So I think there's some room for them to really figure this out, don't you think? There's a, there's a huge amount of room. I mean, in fact, in, in fact, I, I did an interview with Lewis uh, Bennigan, and and that was kind of one of my short-term theses: is that Facebook they, they aren't even really trying to jam the ad loads, right? 
So, Twitter, and in fact, on the last two earnings calls, Facebook has specifically talked about the fact that they probably can't increase ad load much more currently. And and where Twitter, I mean, I I mean, I can use Twitter for half a day and not see an ad. Yeah. So, they, 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 yeah, they, there's a ton of room for Twitter to to uh, to place more ads. And again, they're they're consciously trying not to do that though because they don't want to harm user experience. Put it this way: they had 119 percent growth year over year without a huge increase in ad load, right? So I, I think they're on the right path and they're doing it the right way. Um, you know, I mean, funny thing too, just a total sidewalk. I mean, if people don't think Twitter is is going to have a billion plus users, I, I really don't know what they're smoking because the, the Twitter's already had 750 million people sign up for the service. So, so this whole this whole lark that oh, Twitter is not going to have a billion you know billion users. I mean, it's it's, it's almost. Uh, it, it's sort of just not factually correct. So, so I think we'll see that play out. And there's just been a lot of negativity. Um, by the way, not not to uh, not to mess up with you guys' vibe. I don't know if you you wanted to talk about the the international rectifier, huge premium bid that they just got. I don't I don't know whatever else is on your plate, but that that's a pretty interesting uh, that's a pretty interesting thing that I just thought to throw that out there. Yeah, talk about IRF there. Obviously, the huge uh, day there yesterday, going from twenty six to thirty nine bucks. What are your thoughts there? Well, so here is the interesting thing. Okay, this has been an old school semiconductor company forever. That's been a stock that's been trading cheaply forever on not, not necessarily on PE metrics, but on price to sales and price to book metrics, and sort of a lot of the old school traditional valuation metrics, right? And okay, so. What what happened a year, year and a half ago? Micron was uh, what a six and a half to an eight dollars stock that pretty much everybody hated, and nobody thought it had any meaningful upside. They did a deal for a company called Alpida. Um, well, that whole industry was basically set up that if there was one more deal in the group, all of a sudden everybody has pricing power. So the one thing I'm watching here for International Rectifier isn't so much this name or the, the fact that the, the company that bought them, Infineon. It's okay. How many semiconductor companies now in that particular space? And this is like old school. You know, this is like diodes, capacitors. Uh, you know, I'm trying to even you know high voltage regulators in the, you know voltage circuit type things. I mean, this, this is sort of like bread and butter of motherboard stuff, right? Stuff that has nobody thinks that anybody's had any pricing power on for a decade. So, how many deals in the space will it take it for? A lot of other companies in that in that genre, if you will, to have not just a little pricing power, but a lot. So, for say, anybody who's interested in tech right now, and by the way, I mean I kind of thought the Samsung is the stocks was was getting a little poppy, but this is the kind of stuff we saw in sort of the mid to late nineties when people thought the semiconductor index was topped out and it went up another twofold, right, maybe threefold. So. If, if you, we start seeing deals like this, and especially if we see one more, um, this industry and this subsector of semiconductors could literally be one sort of one sector away from having a few microns spring up, meaning stocks that go, you know, that double or triple. Um, what other, but, what other, but, you know, we, I was oh, going to ask you, is there any other companies that you think, you know, could be potential targets here? Like any specific ones yeah, you're looking so, at? So the, the, yeah, names on my radar would be, in, in fact, this company was, was rumored the other day was Fairchild Semi, that's FCS. Um, again, really cheap stock. Um, another one would be Semtech, uh, SNTC. Yeah. Uh, and and they, they just had an earnings report was okay. But interestingly, the stock was up about 4 to 6% on a sort of a muted earnings report. So I think maybe some people, I mean, that, that's, that may be one of my favorite names right there. Um, on semi O N N N um, micro semi M S C C. So there, there's quite a few names. I mean, there's the, the, you can make a very strong case, by the way, that this this was an area that was in need of consolidation because there's there's frankly too many players, and one deal doesn't doesn't change that. But there there comes a point in in every single area of tech, and we've seen this with the hard disk drive makers, right? Why why did Western Digital go from what twenty dollars to a hundred and Seagate go from fifteen to eighty. Um, there was literally one more deal that needed to happen, and all of a sudden the remaining players became super powerful and had great price and power. And the stocks had told the story. Um, that's exactly what happened to Micron. I love Micron um, a number of times. I mean, the last time I bought it big was probably between eight and twelve, 
and I was lucky enough to ride it most of the way into like the mid twenties. I sort of missed some of this recent move, but there again, you know, once once to get a double triple, I'm pretty thrilled. I don't need to stay in the train that much longer. So, but this, this space again, uh, p- people definitely should be kind of put, put this way: bring out the books and say, "Hey, is there a semiconductor company that's been around for about 20 years that nobody's been excited about? All of a sudden, people might be more excited about a, a number of these names." But yeah, the, the, the ones I gave are, are probably my favorite: Fairchild, Semtech, On, and you know, maybe there's a couple others. My, Microsemi. Is there an ETF that covers the semiconductors that you like? Uh, you know, probably not. And, and here's why: it, it, for some reason, I mean, there's a bunch of e- good ETFs in the semiconductor space. Yeah, they're very. They seem to be very heavily weighted towards towards Intel, though. And and, and yeah, I would okay. rather just own Intel. But like the SMH. That has a huge weight. It's sort of like uh, there's a huge weight in an Intel and a few other names are sort of almost levered to Intel anyway. So the the problem with those ETFs is you're not really getting a good uh, a good mix of semis. Um, It's not like an equal weighted. It's a very heavily market cap weighted in favor to just a small number of names. So yeah, unfortunately, there's uh, at least I mean I'm more of an individual stock guy anyway. But for, it seems like every time I've looked at semiconductor ETFs, they're like, well, I'd rather just I'd rather just do Intel because that's kind of what I'm getting. <laughs> you know what I mean? We've got the chat here. Hurt Capital asking about a few semis here too. Uh, what do you think of IDTI, SWKS, and CAVM? Do you follow those companies? I do. Okay, so cadmium is sort of more in my traditional space because because a lot of the research I've done tends to be more sort of the high capacity, more advanced semiconductor. Because that, you know that's kind of where I tend to work in tech, right? What's leading? What's new? What has market share growth? All that kind of stuff. Cadmium is interesting. The only issue I have with you now, cadmium also has had a lot of M and A rumors lately. It, it sort of this fifty five level, unless you're sort of a momentum trader and you're willing to you know, have a pretty good stop discipline and stuff like that. I This is not one I could sort of embrace from sort of my valuation matrix anymore. I mean, I, I love growth, but it, I still have to beat my valuation stuff. Cadium, you know, Cadium, I, this is a name I, you know, I love in like the high 30s, low 40s. At, at 55, I can't do much. I, um, again, they could get taken. They're, they're sort of the last solo player in that particular space that they do. Integrated device is another one where, I don't know. That's that's just sort of a hot name at a 52 weeks slash multi-year high. Uh, like I would much rather do a Semtech or you know than this name. Um, th- th- there's a little bit of hype in- involved in integrated tech, integrated device too. There there's a lot of theories that they're going to have a lead. They're going to be the leader in, in wireless charging and stuff like that. And, and so far they probably are. But you know there's probably going to be disruption. A lot of other people will enter that space. So there again it's. You know, I'm, I'm really not that excited about that name. I mean, it could, but this is the funny thing. I'm not that excited about the stock. This stock could go up a lot. You know, it, but it, you get kind of got to watch these. I mean, I guess if I were to trade this, I would just say, hey, if it breaks, uh, you know, 60, 90 to 17, right? And boom, it, it, it's clearly in the no resistance zone of new highs. You know, buy it and ride it, right? I mean, you, basically with, with, with those, with those companies you mentioned, they're kind of the setup's the same. It, they could go up a lot more, and pretty much you can trade two-day highs, three-day highs, or 52-week high breaks. Uh, and then if you have a decent stop discipline, you know, some of these things are going to explode, right? So I tend to like stuff more, though, that I can get a good fundamental thesis on that is, let's say, more in the, you know, it's becoming an early breakout as opposed to having, you know, a late breakout. I, what, what was the other one? He, I caught the first two. What was the? Uh, he had a third name there. Uh, IDTI was that, was that it? One more. Uh, one, it, one more time. IDTI Integrated Device Technology. Uh, I just got that one. I just SWKS. got that one. I, SWKS. Uh, Skyworks. Oh, Skyworks. I. You know. Oh my God. This, this was. This was actually. I wrote a piece. This was my top. One of my top picks of 2013. So if we went back and looked, where was the stock trading at the beginning of 2013? It was less than half of where it is here. So this has been a long time winner for me. Now now this is the one again, it's got momentum. You can trade high breaks. The, uh, of, of the, the first two I would probably rather trade than this one now. I do think Skyworks has, has gotten a little hot near term and needs to consolidate. They're gonna have a very, very good iPhone cycle though. I mean there's a whole reason they've gone basically from twenty five to fifty five is that they keep winning more content in iPhone devices. And the, the large screen iPhones are going to sell like hotcakes. 
So th- this is probably a pretty good momentum candidate too. Uh, probably my biggest reason, though, I, I'm, I'm sort of I sort of divest the Skyworks is because I'd rather just play Apple directly. Um, but there again, it, it's a hot name. It's gone up a lot. It could go up a lot more. Um, they're going to bang out two, probably two huge more quarters on on iPhone strength. But you know, there again, I you know, what are you playing for? Are you playing for five or ten more dollars on a name that's already at fifty five dollars? I mean, we'll see. I, like I say, I, I tend to favor stuff that that's a little cheaper that I have fifty to one hundred percent or more type upside that I can that I can value. Um, you know, to me, Skyworks is basically trading sort of at or near full value, and it could get hotter and it could go more. Um, but like, I, I don't really value Skyworks to a hundred bucks, at least not yet. I mean, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I basically see that they're going to have probably two or three more really good quarters, and then I'm not so sure beyond that. I, I kind of like a longer runway. Now, now Sean, when you say uh, uh, you're looking at you know 100 percent more value, how are you quantifying that? Are you look, I mean, you're actually looking at like the tangible book value, or what are you looking at? There's a lot of things you have to kind of look at these things uh, different. I mean. I, I, you know, I, I have a whole valuation matrix I do. I have, you know, hundreds of names I look at. I focus on probably my top hundred. So you kind of have to look, you know, you have to value Apple, Apple differently than you value, you know, Skyworks, obviously. You have to value Twitter and Facebook much, much differently. So it just depends on the name. For each name, I basically have, you know, I try to have a thesis. I try, <clears throat> I try to form what I believe is a growth pattern for the company. I try to have, you know, sort of an estimate and, and then, you know, and then arrive at, at, at a number. I mean, the one thing I do, and I think the one thing really successful tech investors do, is you never really want to look. So, so in other words, I don't, I don't look at a stock just one, one or two quarters out. So I look at a stock one or two years out. And a lot of the key to tech investing is being able to say, okay, it's not just going to have a, a one or two. Because the one thing that will kill a stock, and, and we've seen this over and over, is that, if the big guys, the smart guys, basically say, "Oh, great quarter, good guidance," but they're basically at peak margins, or they're peaking, or they're it's a double, I mean, peak growth and peak margins. I mean, you see these things hit a wall and they just don't go up anymore. By the way, sometimes those guys are wrong, and the stock can continue to do that. But this peak, peak, you know, you get to a peak, peak number, um, you hit a stone wall. Um, you know, we basically saw that happen to Apple in 2012. And it, they were actually right. Apple was at a peak, right? They were at a peak in growth and they were at a peak in margins and the stock got killed. Um, but yeah, for, for, for each stock, for each stock I do, I basically try to value it and I try to look out into what I call the out year. So not just one year forward, but two years forward. Um, I mean, if you're looking at Twitter and Facebook, you have to do that anyway. Anybody worth their salt has to do that. And at the same, so, so I do that, I have a whole valuation matrix and then, and then I, you know, I try to look at these things and do a really good job on, on technicals on them. And sometimes you're going to to throw out the technicals. I think with sometimes with Twitter, um, you know, you 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 have to basically be willing to throw out the technicals if you have a really strong fundamental belief. But so, sorry, there's no easy, clean answer for that. Basically, analyzing tech is pretty complex. Hey, you if, know, if, if it was easy, everybody it, it, would do it, Sean. The, yeah, there you go. I mean, there's, there's, unfortunately, there's sort of no clean, um, you, you gotta, what I call it, it's like Ben Hogan and golf, right? You kind of gotta dig it out of the dirt. All right. Well, I think we just found our new tech analyst, Dennis. Uh, Sean. Yeah, I think we did too. This guy knows his stuff. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Sean, do me a favor. We're, we ran out of time here, but there were a couple more tickers in the chat room. Sure, fire them off. Ton of guys in there. If you want to jump inside the chat, we got to wrap it up here and send it over to Brianna. But oh, okay. Hop into that chat. That uh, they'd love for you to answer some questions. Um, uh, P P O W I S W I R. But Sean, we'd love to have you on the show again, and uh, um, you know, kind of create our, our tech spotlight with you. I'll always enjoy being on, guys. Thanks.